Good afternoon, dear colleagues and dear participants. As Associate Dean of FGV Direito São Paulo, I would like to say that is a great pleasure to have you all here to start this third week of the first University of Chicago Law School and FGV Direito Rio and São Paulo in this forum in law and economics in Brazil. This online first forum, Chicago FGV, fulfills, at least in part, the purpose of taking forward the joint initiatives of our law schools to organize annual meetings on law and economics in Brazil. We believe this online forum is a good example of what we expect to do face-to-face -face next year in Sao Paulo and Rio. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues, Omri ben Shaha and Todd Henderson from the University of Chicago Law School, and my dear colleagues, uh, Rodrigo Viana and Antonio Maristello Porto from Rio FGV Direito for all their energy and enthusiasm to organize this venture. Our special thanks to the Chicago FGV teams that spare no effort to make this event happen in the best possible way. Before uh, we start, I would like to remind you that all statements by Fundação Getúlio Vargas employees and guests in our online events and broadcasters exclusively represent their opinions and not necessary FGV institutional position. We also reiterate that everyone presents here agreed to participate in this event of their own free will, and they consented to be recorded in this broadcast, which will be posted later at FGV and Chicago University official channels. I would like to remind you that it's possible to send comments or questions through a Slido link from the YouTube description. Please feel free to do so. This week, the economic analysis of corporate and sec securities law will be discussed. Professor Todd Henderson today and Professor Mariana Pragenda Thursday will conduct this discussion. Professor Omri ben Shaha will present our lecture for this afternoon. Professor Todd Henderson. Omri, please, I will pass you the microphone for your words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Lucia and Rodrigo, for inviting us to join you in this now third week of the Chicago FGV Forum on Law and Economics. We hope that this will be, as we mentioned in previous weeks, the beginning of a long-term collaboration between two great institutions in promoting new ways of thinking, both in your community and in ours. It is my great pleasure to introduce today my close colleague and close friend, close friend, Professor Todd Henderson, to give the lecture. Todd needs no introduction but just in case, just to make you all enjoy hearing what you already know, he is a, a world famous uh, scholar and authority in the areas of corporate law and the securities regulation. He's written extensively in these areas, uh, is a very popular teacher in, of, of these fields, as well as, as of many other fields. Todd is, what uh, characterizes Todd is his infinite curiosity is always on to new ideas and new things. It's taught banking regulation and American Indian law as well. Uh, what few people know about Todd is that he also writes detective stories. In fact, he writes excellent detective stories, page turners. Uh, his first book has already been published a year ago, a little more, two years ago. It's called Mental State. I think his second book in the series is forthcoming. Um, it is a, a, a great, always a great pleasure to both read what Todd writes and hear what he has to say. And therefore, I will step aside and give him the podium. Todd. Obrigado, Omri, and uh, <clears throat> welcome. Thank you to everybody for joining. 
Um, I have uh, two apologies at the beginning. First, I apologize that uh, I do not uh, no follow Portuguese, so I don't speak Portuguese. So you're going to have to listen to me in English, and I apologize for that. It's a beautiful language, and I, I have actually tried to study a little bit of it, but uh, I just cannot learn languages. So uh, you're going to have to listen to me in English. And my second apology is that I'm not there in person. Uh, Omri and I visited uh, last year uh, and came to Brazil, uh, me for the, for the third time, and uh, fell in love with the country, um, mostly because of the people. Uh, there are beautiful countries everywhere, but in, in Brazil, uh, just I was overwhelmed with the generous spirit, kindness, and a word that Omri just used about me, which I think is the ultimate compliment. Uh, curiosity. So I'm delighted to be talking to you. I wish I was there in person. And as uh, Maria Alicia said, we look forward to bringing this spirit uh, to you in Brazil soon uh, and learning from you as much as uh, we are uh, teaching. So with that, let me uh, start. I'm going to share my screen here. <clears throat> The subject of, um, and, and I look forward, I'll leave plenty of time for questions. So if you do have questions, please uh, share those with the hosts. Um, I think we could get a lot out of the Q&A exchange. So I'll try to leave a time for that. Uh, the topic for today is a corporate and securities law. And I'm gonna do a little bit of a, a mix of different things in this talk. Uh, first of all, talking about two different fields, corporate law and securities regulation. Uh, and some background on those. I'm going to give some history. We'll start in the 1300s in what is now Belgium uh, and do a sort of quick march through a lot of the basic principles of U.S. corporate law with my particular take on them. Uh, and we'll do a little bit of a shorter but similar version with securities regulation. Uh, and then I'm going to take some time to uh, introduce you to a couple of my ideas. Those are in the brackets there. One a corporate law idea and one a corporate uh, a securities law idea. So a little bit of mix of history and doctrine and some uh, new ideas. And hopefully that will keep, keep this interesting even though we're doing it uh, here on uh, Zoom or on uh, YouTube as it were. So I work at the University of Chicago Law School. That means I'm contractually obligated like LeBron James has to wear uh, Nikes or talk about Gatorade. Uh, I have to mention Ronald Coase in every lecture, so let me just get that out of the way at the beginning. For those of you who don't know Ronald Coase, I uh, taught at my law school. He's the only law professor ever to win a Nobel Prize. He wrote uh, influentially in a lot of fields. Many people know him for his work, uh, The Problem of Social Cost and the Coase Theorem, which is about uh, legal rules and bargaining and the like. Um, he wrote a very influential paper that's more near and dear to my heart in 1937 called The Nature of the Firm. And uh, Coase's real genius was asking really good questions. Um, you know, it, a lot of law professors think they have all the answers. And uh, Coase instead asked really smart questions and I think uh, made more progress on uncovering truth in that way. And his question in The Nature of the Firm was, why does economic production take place in these things called corporations or firms as opposed to through market transactions? Why isn't it that we just write individual contracts with people for the production of various things? Um, why is it that we form these separate entities called corporations um, in the first place? So one take on that, and, and we'll come back to this a little bit later, uh, one take on that is to look back at the history of corporations. And the first corporations that arose in human history were really about trying to reduce the costs of human cooperation and what I call collective action. We can accomplish things as individuals, but if we had to rely on individual economic production, we wouldn't get very far. We would still be living in caves like our ancestors. We might form small groups uh, like a tribe or a small family and have some division of labor. Uh, but the ability to work together, to cooperate, allows us to specialize. That specialization allows us to be more productive. Uh, and the move towards collective action 
happens in Europe uh, in the 14th century as a means of acting collectively. And the first uh, example that I can come across is this company uh, called the Company of Merchants of the Staple. They got, as you can see there, the Royal Charter in 1319. And what was going on here was you had uh, wool merchants. Uh, these were British people who came from England with wool from sheep. They've got a lot of sheep in England. Uh, and they were selling their wool to uh, people who would turn that sheep into cloth in what is now Belgium. Each of those individual English wool merchants would enter into contracts with people there in Belgium. And there was the risk that those an individual merchant would cheat. Maybe they would cheat on quality or maybe they would cheat on price. Maybe they wouldn't deliver at all. And for uh, the merchants, the, the British merchants who were not cheating, this was a real problem because uh, without a good way to distinguish between English merchants, there weren't well-established brands or any kind of documents at the time that would allow them to distinguish themselves. Without the ability to do that, cheating would impose costs on other English merchants. So the British wool merchants had an incentive to try to reduce cheating. They had an incentive to have good behavior because they all rose and fell together. But they were there in, in uh, Belgium. They weren't in England. They were far from their British king. Um, cheating was something that would be very hard to police. And the authorities in that part of the world didn't have uh, regulatory control over uh, British merchants. So these merchants had a really good idea. Let's get together and form a company the company of merchants of the staple, we will all be associated with employees of this company. And if we cheat, the company will throw us out and we will uh, not be able to sell wool in Belgium because people will only deal with the company of merchants of the staple. The company of merchants of the staple created a board of the sort of first board of directors and that board's authority, there were 24 of them, their job was really government. It was regulatory. Their job was to write rules, establish policies, detect violations of those policies, and enforce those against cheaters. A very governmental kind of job. It very much evokes corporate governance as we have it today, as boards are constituted, something we'll talk about. This same logic that the company was a regulatory body bringing discipline to the economic production applied uh, through the Dutch East India Company and then early US corporations. Um, Alexander Hamilton has been big in the news here because of the famous play. Uh, he started a corporation called the Society for Useful Manufacturers uh, after the uh, Republicans, uh, Thomas Jefferson would not let the government uh, build this company, he made it a private entity, but brought a lot of the governmental ideas of oversight uh, to it. So we have as the start, companies, uh, uh, one answer to Coase's question is, companies arise to serve this kind of disciplinary function, allowing collective action to happen, that otherwise collective uh, economic production to happen that otherwise uh, wouldn't. The first corporations are formed uh, throughout the world, pardon me, uh, with the imprimatur or approval of the government or the state. Uh, in my country, uh, 29 companies are chartered before the American Revolution of 1789. And almost all of these companies were to do specific tasks that were government tasks. Build a canal, build a port, build a bridge over the Charles River. These were not what we think of today as the typical corporation, manufacturing uh, or, or the like. And you had to go to the legislature, ask for its permission, and the company would be given a charter that was limited in scope something we'll talk about it in a second. And obviously this 
uh, having to go to the government and ask permission uh, if your government in Brazil is anything like our government here, and I suspect it is uh, both today and then, uh, not a place known for risk-taking or innovation, and the possibility that people would use that government power as a means of, of what economists call rent-seeking, uh, basically seeking favors or special treatment because of power in the government uh, and not in the marketplace. Uh, a good example of this, something we'll talk about a little later, uh, uh, there was a policy that you had to do, uh, get permission from state governments in the United States to sell stock. Uh, this persisted uh, into the 1980s in some places. In 1980, a company called Apple Computer went to the government in Massachusetts and asked if they could sell stock to people in Massachusetts. This is where Boston is uh, and Harvard University. And the uh, infinite wisdom, the government of Massachusetts said, no, 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 you can't sell Apple computer stock. It's too risky uh, for our citizens. And so they were forbidden from uh, doing that. So government approval for formations of corporations is going to retard innovation and risk taking and lead to rent seeking. And then in 1811, <coughs> New York state uh, upsets everything by passing a very liberal corporate formation statute. It allowed free incorporation. You no longer needed the assistance of the legislature or the permission of the legislature. Uh, and it could be for any purpose. It didn't have to be for a discrete purpose like uh, building a bridge or a canal or a port. For the first time, corporations could do things that weren't the standard government uh, social uh, function. And of course, <clears throat> quickly thereafter, there are exogenous technological changes, um, things like the railroad, which really upset our expectations about what kind of law and social technology is necessary to succeed. In 1840, to give you an example, the cost of a manufacturing facility in Philadelphia, you're building um, tables or making sailcloth or shoes, a typical manufacturing facility would cost about a thousand pounds to build. A one, uh, a two kilometers of railroad to lay two kilometers of railroad in 1840 cost 25,000 pounds. So 25 times the cost of a manufacturing facility to build two kilometers of railroad. Uh, England from 1846 to 1850 spent its entire gross domestic product on building 8,000 miles of railroads. So the exogenous shock of inventing the steam engine and the railroad opens up the possibility of cooperation at massive scales. No longer are you just cooperating with people in your little town or people that you know, families that you know, now you're, you can cooperate with people all over the country. But the amount of money necessary necessitated innovation in the form of social technologies uh, and that social technology is uh, free incorporation. And it's not surprising, uh, I call corporations mankind's greatest invention, not surprising that you see this kind of hockey stick where for 200,000 years of human history, we live in dirt poor poverty, always on the razor's edge of death. And then right around this time, the early part of the 19th century, where you have huge advances in real technology like the steam engine, and then social technology innovates to capitalize on that real technology, you see this tremendous growth in, uh, in wealth. The, New York incorporation statute right at that inflection point. As I mentioned, uh, corporations originally were serving governmental functions, but pretty quickly uh, we got around to the idea that they could serve any function at all. Uh, you see there some language in the bullets uh, that MBC is the Model Business Corporations Act. So it's a pretty standard US formulation. Uh, corporate actions cannot be challenged on the ground that the corporation lacked that power. And then you see companies like uh, Dow DuPont, that's a big American chemical company, who has pursuant to Delaware law put in place its, in its charter, its founding documents, uh, very broad 
corporate purposes. The purpose of the company is to engage in any lawful act or activity for which a corporation may now or hereafter be organized under the laws of Delaware. In other words, we can take the money from shareholders, apply it to the labor of our employees, and we can do whatever we want with it. It has to be something, an activity that is permissible by the law of Delaware, which is everything legal. So if you take money from shareholders under the auspices of being a chemical company like Dow DuPont, and instead you want to become a media company, there's nothing that prevents you from doing that. Uh, my father worked for his whole career at a company called Westinghouse. They were a big industrial uh, power company. Uh, they just up and decided they wanted to be, uh, the CEO decided they wanted to be a media company. So they bought CBS, a big television broadcaster, and then the manufacturing business just disappeared and they became uh, a media company. Uh, this would have been inconceivable to people in the 19th century. And what checks, what uh, prevents the uh, managers from doing things, taking the money and applying to things that shareholders don't want to do? Well, the discipline of the market. Uh, shareholders know that they can do, that managers can do this. So they uh, anticipate that and the amount they're willing to pay for shares reflects that possibility. Uh, shareholders have power to uh, voice their disagreement um, and the market provides some kind of uh, check. What is the purpose of the you know, companies can basically do whatever they'd like with shareholder money, <coughs> excuse me, but to what purpose should they put that money? Um, there's a very ongoing robust debate about this happening and I'll just sort of survey this for you uh, quickly. Uh, the first word uh, that came that's uh, an important um, uh, milestone is the case Dodge versus Ford Motor Company. Uh, the Dodge brothers, Dodge is now a separate car company, but at, at the time, uh, the Dodge brothers worked for Henry Ford. Uh, they provided a lot of the uh, engineering and skill that went into the Ford cars uh, and they were big shareholders. And Ford stopped paying dividends because he was reinvesting the profits from the Ford Motor Company in the company. He was reinvesting the profits to try to make it more successful. And the Dodge brothers wanted dividends uh, and they took him to court and they said, uh, Ford is doing things that are not maximizing uh, that are not uh, serving our interest. Um, and so they tried to prevent uh, Ford uh, from doing this reinvestment. And the Michigan Supreme Court uh, has a quite broad uh, ruling for Ford and says uh, the purpose uh, Ford uh, claimed that what he was doing was sort of uh, trying to serve society broadly uh, through this. And the Michigan Supreme Court said, no, no, when you take shareholders money, the purpose of that is to make them more money. And if you think by being uh, charitable, uh, you know, you can take shareholders money and be charitable, you can't do that. You have to maximize value for shareholders. So this norm gets ensconced into US law. And in the era of, uh, and that becomes the sort of norm for CEOs, and then in the post-war period, uh, there was a, a quite broad rule established called the business judgment rule. And what the business judgment rule stands for is that uh, managers get to decide. Courts will not be in the business of second guessing managerial decisions. Uh, this is something that sits quite uncomfortably with this idea from Dodge versus Shore that companies have to maximize shareholder value. Because you could imagine in a world in which the uh, Dodge case is uh, dispositive, that shareholders could complain about a particular action and say, that's not maximizing shareholder value. Uh, imagine a company decides instead of moving its manufacturing facility to Brazil, where it could do the work more efficiently, it decides to keep it in the United States because of uh, you know, Trump's view that we should make things in America. And the shareholders could challenge that and say, no, no, you can save money and be more efficient and make us more money as shareholders by moving to Brazil. And imagine the managers say, no, no, we'd like to, we don't, we're okay making a little less money, but we want to do something good for the American communities. In the Dodge versus Ford world, the managers would lose. 
But the way the courts developed the doctrine in this period that I call the era of managerialism, uh, shareholders can't bring those suits. If managers uh, make a choice, their business judgment will be uh, more or less uh, respected. This led to lots of uh, decisions that didn't necessarily maximize shareholder value. And you get a uh, lots of action by investors who see managers making really bad decisions and they move to take over companies. So there's a takeover boom in the early 1960s where investors see uh, managers making lots of bad decisions. They think bad decisions, not profit maximizing decisions. And instead of winning in court, because you can't win in court in the business judgment rule, they say, we'll take over the company and move the plant to Brazil, in my example, and make more profits. Uh, the response to this uh, takeover boom is uh, a piece of legislation in the United States called the Williams Act of 1968, which makes takeovers much more expensive. Managers who were threatened by the discipline of the market ran to Congress and got them to pass a piece of legislation that protected managers' interests. And of course, that piece of legislation was dressed up not as, uh, as I described it, but as protecting corporations, sacred corporations from evil uh, corporate uh, raiders. In the early 1970s, <clears throat> Milton Friedman comes along <clears throat> trying to resurrect this idea of maximizing shareholder value and writes a very famous essay in the New York Times Magazine and says, the purpose of corporations is to make money. Uh, we should not think otherwise. We need to bring back some of that uh, discipline of uh, the market. This starts to happen uh, in the 1980s. We get the rise of leveraged buyouts and takeovers again. We see, start seeing executives paid with executive compensation linked to share price for the first time. And this re-energizes the move, the original Dodge versus Ford move to focus on shareholder value. And of course, managers are not very happy with this. They want a response. They run to state legislatures this time and they get states to pass various anti-takeover legislation. Uh, even business friendly Delaware, the law that I spend most of my time studying has one of these provisions, section 203, which limits certain types of business combinations. Um, and so you again see managers uh, using the power of government to entrench their positions. Academics in the, the right after this period, so in the early 1990s, come around to the view that instead of maximizing shareholder value, we should be maximizing a firm value. And then the 2000s brings with it uh, the private equity boom, uh, low interest rates following the terrorist attacks of 9-11 uh, in 2001 uh, lead to debt being quite cheap. And so you see uh, the takeovers of this era being fueled by debt as opposed to uh, prior markets. And again, we see a response. Uh, the response I see uh, is uh, here that I have here is this focus on ESG, environmental, social, and governance investing where investors of certain types say, we're gonna focus on um, things that have other than to do with shareholder money, uh, the benefit of communities and the like, uh, another response has been by trying to demonize uh, investors, hedge fund managers. Uh, that's had some success. Lots of hedge fund investors have gotten in trouble for things like insider trading. I think a lot of those are driven by cultural changes that, uh, again, cast these investors as bad guys uh, and uh, driven by managerial self-interest. Another interesting development has been the rise of so-called uh, B Corps. These B Corps are uh, companies that put into their charter that their function is not just to make shareholders money, but to do other stuff as well. Uh, you can create a B Corp in Delaware now, uh, where you bake, you put into the charter that you have this dual purpose. Uh, a couple interesting things about this. The first point is uh, nothing prevented you before B Corps were authorized by statute from doing this already. Companies can put in their charter what they like. Uh, if you wanted to be a, a charitable organization in part, you could put that in your charter. And as long as you were very clear when you took the shareholder's money, we're gonna take your money and we're gonna be not just making you money, but also doing good for the world. 
uh, there's nothing that prevented you from doing that. So it's interesting that Delaware thought that they needed to pass this statute when clearly their free contracting version uh, suggested you didn't. Another problem or interesting element of this is if you think about the ESG world, um, if you tell managers uh, maximize shareholder value, as the manager of the company, I know what to do on a daily basis. I can uh, see very clearly the stock price and the stock price tells me how well I'm doing at serving the interests of shareholders. It is a instantaneous evaluation. It's like you're getting graded every second of every day. If instead I tell you, uh, the CEO of a company, I'd like you to maximize stock price, interacted with environmental, interacted with social, interacted with governance, interacted with a bunch of other things. Now I'm trying to maximize along four dimensions. That's a real problem. It's very hard to serve four masters as opposed to one. Another thing that makes it complicated is there's no real good metrics. <coughs> How am I doing on serving the environment? I don't know. There's certainly nothing like the stock price. Uh, and then a final potential problem is these things are not always vectors pointing in the same direction. What might be good for the environment could be really bad for society. Uh, closing down all of your oil refineries, really great for the environment, really bad for the workers who work at those factories, not to mention all of the potentially knock-on effects. The last word in this story about purpose of uh, companies is a case from uh, 2010 called eBay versus uh, Newmark. This case was really about something called Craigslist. I don't know if you all have this uh, Craigslist in uh, Brazil, but it started out as sort of a uh, one of these uh, idealistic internet sites, no advertising, just a place where people could come and post things for sale a kind of free online marketplace. Uh, and Craigslist became incredibly popular place for people to go on the internet. Uh, it attracted the interests of eBay who took a large stake in it. eBay was a large minority shareholder. And when the founders of Craigslist, this guy Newmark and one other guy, uh, resisted some of the changes that eBay wanted to make to it to monetize it, they wanted to put advertising on it for instance, uh, and actually make some money with this company. Uh, the founders of Craigslist objected and said, you know, a very sort of hippie uh, response, which is, we just want to make this cool place where people can offer stuff up and, and interact, man. We don't want to make money. Uh, eBay took them to court, and the Delaware Chancery Court in 2010 said, uh, uh, evoking Dodge versus Ford, you got to, if you're going to take share, shareholders' money, you got to try to make them money. I think this is an interesting development because uh, in Delaware now, at least, you have this choice that seems pretty clear. If you want to be uh, charitable in non-trivial amounts, you can be a B Corp. And if not, we've kind of come full circle back to the Dodge versus Ford world, although we still have the business judgment rule. So as long as your charitable acts or your non-profitizing acts can be spun as actually serving the long-term interest of the corporation, then that's fine. So back to my example with Brazil, if you say we're going to uh, keep this plant in the United States because we think that will make people buy our products more because they like the fact that we're building things in the United States as, to, as opposed to offshoring them, that's a defensible uh, move. Limited liability is a um, key feature of uh, corporate law. It has ancient roots back to Roman law, um, but it really takes off in the United States. Uh, uh, New York's 1811 statute had limited liability, but a big driver in spreading limited, the idea of limited liability uh, was the idea of federalism in the United States. Because corporate law in the United States is a state-based law, if I start a corporation here in Illinois and my headquarters are here in Illinois and Chicago, I can choose the law of any of the other 49 states or Illinois law to be the law of my corporation. There's a quote there in the fourth, uh, fifth bullet point of a commentator in Massachusetts. Massachusetts had unlimited liability for its companies in 1829. And as a result, people were leaving 
to go to other jurisdictions to start their businesses. Um, and so this idea that you could, through forum selection, choose your state law really drove the expansion of limited liability. And what limited liability does is it allows you to structure the business in a way that forces, uh, that focuses uh, and allows shareholders to know I'm investing $100 uh, in this corporation. The most I can lose is $100. That means I can give you my money and walk away knowing exactly what's at stake. Uh, that allows the separation where I can just be an investor and I don't have to worry uh, so much about what's happening in the company. This kind of collective action and specialization that I talked about at the very beginning is facilitated by this kinds of rule. If I know that um, you know, if the company does something bad that I could have unlimited liability and they could take my house uh, or all my uh, possessions, then I'm going to insist on being in control. Being in control uh, raises the cost of control, especially as the number of potential investors increases. That really reduces the possibilities of this diffuse collective action I talked about at the beginning. Okay, so that's... Uh, what is described here. I should I just note uh, this point at the end, which is the question about limited liability. A lot of uh, my students often bristle because they, it seems like uh, companies can get away with uh, uh, externalizing their costs. Uh, I should just go back here and, uh, and note this case at the bottom, Wolkowski versus Carlton. Uh, this is a famous case involving a guy running taxi cabs in New York City in 1960s. He was very clever. He knew that his cabs were going to get in accidents. So what did he do? He created companies for each of his cabs. So if he had a hundred cabs operating in New York, each cab was a separate company. And the assets and liabilities of that company were limited to the cab. And every day that cab would produce a certain amount of income. The company would take in that cash. And then every day would issue a dividend to its owner, this guy, uh, Mr. Carlton, who would take all the cash from these hundred companies into the parent company. And when one of the cabs hit Mr. Wolkowski and caused him some injuries, he tried to sue the cab company and found out it was just this cab, this beat up cab that wasn't worth very much. Mr. Wolkowski then said, oh, well, actually, look, it's these hundreds of cabs and this owner where all the cash has gone up. I want to sue all of them because that's the real and the court said, no, 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 you're allowed to incorporate with the specific intent of limiting your liability. Totally fine uh, to do that. Um, my students often bristle at that because it seems unfair. And what I try to focus their attention on is the idea of uh, corporate law as insurance. By forcing these other cab companies and the owner to pay you're basically making them an insurer of Mr. Carlton, and that would be the right decision. But we wanna compare the efficiency of having them be the insurance provider for his medical losses versus somebody else. What happens if uh, Mr. Wolkowski can't recover? Well, if he can't, first of all, Mr. Wolkowski could buy insurance for his medical injuries, first party insurance. If he doesn't have the insurance, then the government might provide some insurance for him. Uh, he comes to the hospital, even in the United States where we don't have socialized medicine. If you're injured and you go to the hospital and you can't pay the bills, the hospital just eats the losses and spreads it across its uh, patients, or maybe the government will pay depending on where you are. So we've got those different types of insurance. First party insurance, you buy your own health insurance, covers your losses. The hospital pays, the government pays, or corporate law could pay by requiring companies that are organized close together or in ways that seem kind of unusual to have to pay. And the judgment that the US courts have made is those lines are too difficult to draw in corporate law. We're going to let people organize their corporate law affairs that way, except in very extreme cases and rely on these alternative measures of insurance because this encourages corporate formation uh, and innovation and risk-taking. <clears throat> 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 
boards of directors that I mentioned early on have uh, two duties in the United States, uh, duties of care, to, to be careful. Um, this requires that you act as you would if you were an ordinarily careful and prudent person. Uh, and this, uh, this uh, provisions that boards have to act careful um, is a, uh, the, the trade-off here is between giving people uh, the authority to make decisions and the costs of having people being second guests. It's very easy to criticize someone ex post for making decisions that don't turn out well, uh, but doing so raises costs because now uh, uh, managers will know that they're going to be second guessed. And because court decisions are not free, it's costly for courts to make decisions. There's decision costs and error costs. Uh, courts can get it wrong. Encouraging litigation uh, can be a real drain on corporations. And so the uh, general rule in the United States is that although managers have an obligation to be very careful, this generates uh, basically no lawsuits. There is one very famous case, Smith versus Van Gorkum, a Delaware case from the 1985, where the Supreme Court of Delaware looked at a merger. This merger happened during the intermission at the Lyric Opera in Chicago, where a very famous corporate raider, uh, Mr. Pritzker, uh, who's, uh, I guess grand nephew now is the governor of my state uh, uh, and um, uh, went to this, uh, uh, the owner of a, of a company called TransUnion, Mr. Van Gorkum, and said to him, I'd like to buy your company and wrote on a, a champagne napkin, here's the price I'm willing to pay. And there was a, a, a sort of agreement that was reached and the board just went through the motions and approved that. And that was too much for the Delaware Supreme Court. They said the board wasn't being careful enough and it made the directors personally liable for their sloppiness. Uh, the reaction to this was instantaneous. Delaware passed a statute, 102B7, which made it uh, possible for companies to indemnify directors against this kind of liability. They could self-insure by saying, basically, we'll allow you to do uh, duty of care breaches. After Section 102B7 was passed, every Delaware corporation immediately passed one of these provisions allowing for indemnification for uh, directors. Now we have this very strong hierarchy of protections, the business judgment rule, which I mentioned, the waiver of liability in 102B7, uh, and of course they can buy insurance and pay for, inspect, uh, for, for lawsuits. And you would think given this hierarchy that the um, directors wouldn't be very careful, wouldn't do very good jobs, but of course they have other constraints on those. There's a market for talent of directors. Uh, directors uh, can be voted out of office by shareholders. So this is a, 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 a recognition that legal rules uh, are, can only be so effective and they come with huge costs because they uh, promote litigation which uh, may be a very ineffective way of dealing with uh, corporate problems. The other big corporate law duty for directors is uh, the breach of duty of loyalty. Directors have to be careful. They all also have to be loyal. Originally, the uh, rule in uh, corporations was that man directors could not deal with the firms that they were party to. Uh, you can see there at the bottom a quote, a director of a corporation cannot deal with a corporation which he or she uh, represents. A ban on interested director transactions. This is a prophylactic rule that is obviously uh, over-inclusive. Imagine that there is a particular piece of land very adjacent to the corporation's uh, uh, plant that it would be uh, beneficial for it to buy and it just happens to be owned by the director. Banning the transaction just because there's a conflict seems like an overly broad uh, solution. So there was a statute passed, uh, here's the Delaware statute, which allows these kinds of conflicted uh, transactions as long as they're subject to the various uh, procedural rules. Three ways you can do it. A majority of directors who are not conflicted approve of it. 
there's a vote of the shareholders, or if you don't do those things, a court could look at this and say, yeah, you didn't go through the procedural steps, but ultimately this was a good transaction, a fair corporation uh, transaction for the corporation. So law evolved to realize that broad uh, prohibitions are sometimes over-inclusive and allowing these kinds of transactions uh, might make sense for both shareholders and, um, and directors. A big uh, provision of US corporate law is uh, minority rights and protection of minority shareholders. Uh, there was a case involving uh, an oil company that was invested in Venezuela. That's the Sinclair case mentioned there. Um, the oil company realized that it was, uh, the Venezuelan government was likely to take away their oil leases. So they were issuing dividends, massive dividends of all of their assets in Venezuela to their shareholders and some shareholders complained. Uh, and the, and the, um, the uh, court said, as long as the distributions are proportional to shareholder interest, then the minority can't really uh, complain. In this case, the minority had 3% interest. They were getting 3% of all the dividends. That the uh, dividends would eventually lead to the company in Venezuela having no assets was neither uh, here nor there. And the important thing for minority shareholder interests is to note that minority shareholder rights benefit the majority. The majority benefits because if the minority knows that it can be oppressed and taken advantage of, then they're going to assign a risk premium to their investment to reflect the possibility that they'll be cheated. So the majority binding itself and saying, we won't cheat you gives the minority comfort and allows them to invest on lower, on better terms, that lowers the cost of raising capital, which means more uh, investments will be undertaken even for, for the majority. But importantly, this rule about uh, protection of minority shareholders does not lead to a rule about equality. Majority shareholders don't have to treat minority shareholders equally. And to give you a good example of this, <coughs> in the takeover context, there are cases in which minority shareholders in a takeover have argued they should share equally in the premium that the takeover uh, is being uh, executed at. Uh, those are generally losers in the United States uh, under the theory that although if a takeover offer happens, minority shareholders would prefer to be to get the premium. So imagine the share, the stock price is $100 and the, comp the uh, takeover person comes and says, we will buy control, that is the majority's interest, for $150. The minority shareholders come and say, wait a second, we also want $150 for our shares. And the takeover person says, no, 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 we just want to buy the majority's stake. If the minority sues in the United States, they will lose. And the court's logic is uh, a good one from a law and economic standpoint, yes, contingent on getting an offer, the minority is better off by getting the $150. But if the takeover person knows that they have to share with a minority, they won't take over the company because the cost will be higher for the takeover. Therefore, you'll get fewer takeovers. And fewer takeovers means less chance that the managers who, will, who uh, obviously are not performing well, if the asset is worth $100, to them and 150 for someone else, then the assets moving to a higher valued user, minority shareholders will be stuck with bad managers as opposed to good managers in expectation. And therefore it serves minority interests to have good managers that is a robust market for uh, corporate control. This idea that law should serve to try to promote corporate takeovers was anathema to US corporate law until Henry Manny wrote a very famous paper in 1965 called The Market Mergers in the Market for Corporate Control, in which he talked about that idea. The idea that if managers are doing badly, economic incentives for outsiders to buy the shares, install new managers, and raise the stock price is the single best disciplinary force. Better than a lawsuit, you see the problems with the business judgment rule and the hierarchies of protections better than any kind of court getting involved in doing evaluation is establish a robust market for corporate control. We've seen so far, this has some limits. There are legal rules like anti-takeover statutes, 
politics we've seen raiders are bad guys there's a federal statute that's the committee on foreign investments in the united states CFIUS. if uh, china wants to buy a u.s company the company will claim it's a national security threat to allow the chinese to own that company and prevent the takeover and then of course the gains from the takeover have to be sufficiently large to justify the cost and risk of doing so and that leaves some slack in the market but market forces generally much better than uh, than than uh, than legal ones. Of course, uh, and this is going to lead to the uh, one of my ideas I wanted to talk about, what is good corporate governance? And is there a market for this as opposed to corporate performance? Lots of people talk about corporate governance and principles of corporate governance, but it's very hard to articulate uh, what that is. Uh, usually, if we said, lined up what we think the best governed firms are and the best performing firms, that overlap will be pretty substantial. Good corporate governance looks like good corporate performance. The counterfactual that we want to know, which is, would this company be worth even more and doing even better under different management is impossible, of course, to know. And there's no stock price for corporate governance. There's just these vague standards promulgated by people who probably have their own uh, selfish interests. Okay, to, so to address this, and I want to just do this quickly so we can um, uh, get uh, through the rest of the material and have some time for questions. There is a question about why boards in the United States and, and elsewhere are provided by individuals as opposed to groups of people. Uh, in the United States, boards, here's a Boeing, <clears throat> the Boeing board are these people here on, uh, on uh, the left side of your screen. Each of those people serves Boeing as an individual sole proprietor. They're not allowed to affiliate with each other. When Boeing buys other services, consulting services, accounting service, law, law service, it hires firms. McKinsey is a firm, Kirkland and Ellis is a firm, KPMG is a firm. When it hires governance, it hires these individuals. So that's very odd. And it got me thinking, boy, why wouldn't it be better if Boeing over here could hire a governance firm as opposed to these individuals? Uh, firms have lots of advantages. Uh, why do firms exist? Ronald Coe's, they can share risks. They have economies of scale. Uh, they have access to information. If you're an individual board member, you don't know anything about cybersecurity. You have to go out and buy that information in the market from someone. If you're a firm, you can have lots of people who work at the firm who have that information available to you and you don't have to buy it in the market. You just go and ask them for it uh, as opposed to uh, writing a contract. Firms have reputations like the companies of merchant, the company of merchants of the staple. Creating a firm makes a higher level reputation where if one of those people who works for the company merchant of the staple cheats, everybody else ha is affected by that. That's the reputational advantage of a firm as opposed to an individual. So higher reputation and therefore uh, better behavior. Um, boards in the, in the US, and I just go through uh, quickly, have all kinds of uh, limitations. Um, there's lack of expertise. They have very weak incentives. They don't get thrown out very often, so very limited accountability. Uh, so I think even though boards um, are uh, have improved over time, there's still lots of room for improvement. And the suggestion I make in this paper is that instead of having individuals, we have companies buy governance services from firms. These firms would be called, uh, the suggestion we make is a BSP, a board service a provider. <clears throat> you would hire, instead of hiring individuals to be your board, you would hire a board company. It could be a specialty company, a Boards R Us. It could be that a consulting firm like McKinsey has a board service arm to it. Uh, how that would look, uh, it could take on a lot of different forms. The only change, you know, who compensates that entity, how would they make decisions, how big would it be, and so forth. The only big difference would be that the company, the uh, board service provider would make a particular decision. Should we move the plant to Brazil or keep it in the United States? 
that decision would be made by the BSP and it would be accountable for that decision. In the United States, uh, board services as they are today are provided by sole proprietors. This is about a $30 billion industry. And if you tell me, I mean, I'm a law professor, so I don't know very much, but if you tell me there's a $30 billion business that is provided by sole proprietors, that is a business that is ripe for vertical integration just because of economies of scale. Firms could take on a lot more risk. I'm an individual board member. Uh, it's very, I'm very risk averse. I don't wanna take on that kind of risk. If I'm a firm, I could take big, much bigger equity stakes in companies. This looks like private equity a little bit, except without having to buy all the economics risk of the firm. As I mentioned in the market for corporate control to take over a company because of the cost and risk of that, you've got to have a huge upside in terms of the economics. But I might look at a company and say, we could do a much better job running that company. We could move the needle by $10 million. $10 million isn't probably enough to justify the takeover of a whole company, the debt service and the risk of that. But if we're just taking over the board, that may be uh, justifiable uh, for a smaller uh, stake. Liability incentives, uh, risk sharing allows for uh, bigger uh, liability judgments. Delaware courts are very reluctant to hold individual directors liable for corporate wrongdoing because corporate directors are people like me. And the Delaware Supreme Court, if I was found to have violated my fiduciary duties as a corporate director, the Delaware Supreme Court might be squeamish about taking my house. It did impose liability in the Smith versus Van Gorkum case that I mentioned, but when Walt Disney got in trouble for paying its CEO $150 million for one year of really bad work, and that case went to the Delaware Supreme Court, the Delaware Supreme Court did not hold the directors personally liable. Instead, it wagged its finger at them and said, you guys didn't do a very good job, but do better next time. They were reluctant to hold the directors personally liable. If it's a firm instead, I think courts would be much more willing to impose costs on firms because of this uh, risk sharing. I mentioned reputation. Uh, firms' reputations are bigger reputation-wise, uh, and this can be a disciplinary a force for them. We don't know anything about corporate voting on boards. Board votes are not disclosed. We have no way to unpack boards' uh, performance from firm performance. And imagine a world instead in which we had publicly traded board service providers. Now, when a company announced we're hiring Boards Are Us to be our board, not only would we have a measure of the impact of the change in the stock price from the company that's hiring Boards Are Us, we have a stock price of Boards Are Us itself, which is the market's assessment of how that company uh, does as a board uh, firm. Right now, the nothing prevents uh, shareholders from taking over a company. Uh, you think a company is being badly run, you can buy shares and vote out the board members. This is a very costly process. Uh, the reimbursement rules in the United States, the company is allowed to pay to protect managers, but uh, insurgents, people from the outside have got to pay their own way. That kind of asymmetry leads to very, very few corporate takeover battles. Board service providers would have a huge advantage. They would have potentially national or global reputations like KPMG. So instead of somebody like me trying to convince other shareholders, hey, vote for me and we'll take over the board and throw them out. Now you could have a globally branded company who challenges, they can spread the risk and cost of those challenges across many assets and use their reputation to lower the costs of uh, takeovers. Okay, I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit uh, and say the uh, conclusion here, uh, and I, I'll share these slides um, with FGV and you can go back and look at them, is a world in which uh, board services are provided by firms. Uh, to make this clear, imagine a legal rule in which companies were required to hire individual lawyers as opposed to law firms to provide legal advice. 
So they hire me to, to provide legal advice on a particular transaction, and it has to be me as an individual. I'm an expert in corporate law, but it turns out that there's some tax implications of the deal that we're trying to put together. So now I, as the sole proprietor, I have to convince them that they need to hire another sole proprietor who does tax law. So they have got to do another transaction and hire a different lawyer to do tax law. And if that lawyer and I want to work together, she and I have to have a contract. Okay, I need some tax help on this. You and I can have a contract together. That make any sense. It might be better for them just to hire my firm, which has corporate and tax. And if I want advice from my tax attorney friend, I can just walk down the hall to her, get her involved in the deal uh, without having to write separate contracts. That's the cozy and insight <coughs> about firms. Firms arise, Co says, when the costs of doing business inside of a firm by fiat, just walking down the hall and saying, could you please do this for me? When that cost is cheaper than doing it by contract, we'll see firms arise. When it's cheaper to do it by contract, we'll see firm sizes shrink. Uh, a good example of this is uh, Apple Computer. Uh, they designed my iPhone in California, but it's manufactured in China because it's cheaper to do that. So the costs of the transactions of negotiating with suppliers in China and having that shipped is lower than having it built in-house in California. The same logic applies here with governance. Uh, insofar as the optimal firm size for corporate governance is, uh, is if you think it's one person, uh, I'm very skeptical of that. I think it's probably much bigger than that. The optimal board size is probably uh, larger than a uh, single individual. Okay, I, I didn't um, get through as much as I would have liked to. Um, so I'm gonna uh, stop because I want to take some uh, questions about corporate law stuff and this board services providers idea. Uh, there's some additional stuff um, in, the, in the slides, which I'm happy to, to uh, talk about for people offline. If you look at these slides and you have questions or comments or wanna talk to me about those, you can, you can reach out to me via email that will be included in the slides. I'd be happy to talk about that stuff. I just didn't, uh, I was too ambitious with my agenda uh, and didn't get through this. But basically in here, there's another idea uh, which is quite related to this market for corporate governance. And the idea here is bringing market approaches to the central problem of securities regulation, which is about informational disclosures. Uh, in my country, uh, the SEC dating from the 1930s uses a very command and control government centric approach to the disclosure of corporate information. Corporations are required to disclose what the government tells them that they have to disclose as opposed to what shareholders actually really want. How can we figure out what shareholders really want and maintain the quality, uh, maybe actually increase the quality of corporate disclosures and have lots of other ancillary benefits? Well, not surprisingly as a Chicago person, we can make a market for corporate disclosures how do you do that in the securities world? Well, we have a proposal for exactly a way that addresses that problem and we think makes uh, securities markets much more efficient. Uh, securities regulation in this country was made in the 1930s. It's almost a century old. It's a very ill fit for the actual realities of stock trading today, which are completely different than they were in the 1930s. And our stock approach to securities regulation has been copied in countries around the world. Uh, and countries that are, are, are copying it now, I think are making big mistakes because they don't recognize how these old rules are ill-fitting for current securities markets. And I can say more about that in the Q&A if, if people would like to. Okay, so let me stop there uh, and open it up for any questions that people might have. Okay. Thanks so much, Professor Henderson, for your uh, wonderful lecture. And also thanking again uh, to participate in such an intrepid initiative. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary Lucia. Okay. And uh, I would like to ask you, please, to Thais, our researcher. Uh, she will take the audience's questions. Please, Thais, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So, so far we only have one question. So if you 
want to send them, please feel free to do so uh, in the Slido link in the YouTube description. So our first question is from Gabriela. She says, in Brazil, unlike in the United States, the payment of dividends to shareholders is not taxed by the government, which creates incentives to the shareholders to distribute the dividends instead of reinvesting in the companies. So looking at this example, can we consider that the regulatory design of the corporate legislation can directly affect the concentration of wealth? Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, I encourage anybody to ask a uh, question. So please uh, fire away on any of these topics or anything else that you want to talk about. Uh, I'm happy to, to, to answer. And, and if we don't have any other questions, I can go back. So uh, that's a great question. I, the tax rules obviously are hugely influential in uh, the way they influence corporate decision making. Uh, and I don't know anything about Brazil, so I hesitate to make any judgments. Um, but in general, I would say it's a better idea to have very neutral tax rules um, that don't have distortions like suggested. So the idea of taxing, uh, you know, having dividends be uh, uh, tax free and encouraging um, the, the dis, 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 dis distribution of corporate profits outside the firm, if that's causing a distortion, then I think that could be a bad uh, rule. Um, you know, I think corporate decisions should be made as much as possible on a tax neutral basis. I'm not a tax scholar, so I'm wading into waters that I think are pretty dangerous. Um, but I'll give you an example of um, this from another area that I have worked on. Um, so uh, everybody wants to um, act altruistically towards other people. It's human nature. And there's lots of different ways that we can act altruistically to help other people. Um, we can act charitably ourselves. We can donate our time or our money to individuals. We could give money to the government and the government could provide goods and services to uh, poor people. Or we could give money, uh, invest in or work for a company, a for-profit company that also acts charitably. All of those techniques are methods of acting altruistically. Um, for instance, imagine I wanted to uh, help somebody who was a farmer in Ethiopia who was poor. I could give money to an NGO who donates money to Ethiopia. I could give money to the US government who gives money directly to the government of Ethiopia. Or I could go to Starbucks and buy fair trade coffee, which is buying coffee that is coffee plus a donation to a farmers in Ethiopia, poor Ethiopian farmers. My choice of how to do that should be based on my own views about the efficiency of those different people in helping the Ethiopian farmer. If I think Starbucks will do a better job, I should go through Starbucks. If I think the government should do a better job, I should go through the government. We show in this paper that I wrote in the Columbia Law Review that the tax rules for those things are treated differently. If I give a money to a charity, I can take a tax deduction. If I buy fair trade coffee, I don't get a tax deduction. So the tax rules, and we go through many more examples in the paper, distort my decision, which should be based on efficiencies. So getting back to your question, the tax rules that are set up should be as neutral as possible in encouraging corporations to do with the money what is the efficient thing, not what is some tax arbitrage. So if having the money in the company and having retained earnings, investing in plants will actually do better for society then we should encourage the company to do that as opposed to doing a dividend just because it's tax advantaged. Now, what the implication is on that for income inequality in Brazil or otherwise, I have no idea. Um, I could spin stories, but they would just be stories. But in general, I think tax policy should be neutral with respect to corporate law decision-making. So um, we have a second question from Luciana. She says, uh, but wouldn't this BSPs become inside traders or pose other types of disclosure problems once they start, once they start having a certain number of clients and how can we avoid that? 
That's a great question. So thank you for that. So uh, conflicts of interest are always a problem. Uh, and I think the way to think of it is think of a law firm. When I worked for Kirkland and Ellis, Kirkland and Ellis took very seriously the risks uh, of potential conflicts. So whenever a new client came in, Kirkland and Ellis, the first thing that would happen is they would do a conflicts check. Is there anybody inside of the firm, and Kirkland Ellis is a global firm with thousands of employees, is there anyone in the firm who has a conflict with this particular client? And that was a matter of the ethical duties of Kirkland and Ellis. So we all have licenses and have ethical obligations. It was also in Kirkland and Ellis's reputational interest because if it was found out to be serving both sides, that would be uh, a real uh, problem for it in uh, the marketplace uh, as well. And also in terms of, you know, if they have to go to court or represent clients uh, and they've found to be on both sides, then those transactions or that court uh, papers may be suspect for that reason. So no, no law against it per se, but market forces that are pro protecting from a conflict of interest. And I would expect the same thing to be true for board service providers. You can't imagine a board service provider uh, working the same one representing both Facebook and Google. They have huge conflicts of interest about the type of internet they're trying to create. Facebook wants to create a walled off internet. Google wants to create the free and open internet. So you can't imagine a board service provider providing uh, serving both of them. And I would expect those conflicts to be resolved as they are in the law context. Your question also raises issues about antitrust. You could imagine a world in which a board service provider got too big, was serving too many companies and had too much market power. And I would think antitrust regulators would have strong incentives to try to police that uh, as well, just to prevent concentrations of market power. Boards are so powerful in the kinds of decisions they make. So I think it's a really good observation that conflicts of interest would be a real potential problem. Now, with respect to insider trading, that's a whole nother uh, subject that we could talk a lot about. <coughs> Excuse me. It's also true with board members today. So board members get inside information as individuals. They have incentives to potentially trade on that information. And there are rules that try to police that. Uh, those rules would apply for board service providers too. I think actually there would be less insider trading because um, the board service providers would have very strong incentives given their reputation from allowing people that work there to engage in insider trading. As an individual person, I'm only betting my own reputation uh, when I do something. If I work for a big firm, every time I act, I'm betting not just my reputation, but the reputation of everybody because everybody can suffer a little bit through reputational harms. That's why firms are so powerful as means of economic uh, production. Just to link this question with the uh, part of the talk that I didn't really get to about securities regulation, in the world that I imagine where companies can sell their corporate information, that's the, the innovation in the securities regulation part, uh, if companies are allowed to sell their corporate information as opposed to give it away for free as they do now, they would actually have a much stronger incentive to police insider trading because if the market knows that there is insider trading happening, the value of corporate information is dramatically reduced because it's already been incorporated. People are trading on it ahead of time. It's already been incorporated into the stock price. So I encourage you, maybe if you're interested in this topic, to look at that paper. Uh, it's a, a market-based approach to securities regulation in the Chicago Law Review, which talks about the way, one of the ways that we can get at insider trading if we marry that with the BSPs, I think that's another uh, answer to your question. Um, so our third question, I think, is from Alex. Um, he says, if boards can be composed by corporations instead of people, considering that the companies may bankrupt, how does that play out? For instance, in Brazil, if a corporation files for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, their actions still play out. Is that how it works in the U.S.? And if so, what if the company simply goes bank bankrupt and cannot deliver what they were brought on to deliver? Okay, I, um, 
I think I understand part of that. So what happens if uh, the board service provider uh, goes bankrupt? I think that's the, 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 the question. Um, so uh, right now, uh, the way that uh, uh, board services are offered is by individuals. And the amount of money that individuals have to provide to the company in the event there's some problem, let's say in the Smith versus Van Gorkum case where there's liability. If I serve as a corporate director and it's possible, law professors, uh, I, I'm not on a board of directors, but law professors are, uh, and I commit a violation of the duty of loyalty or duty of care, and I'm held personally liable. Um, first of all, the company will have bought me insurance. That's called directors and officers insurance. Uh, and that will cover some portion of it. And presumably the company would also buy directors and officers insurance for bird services providers. Although my guess is because the BSPs will be firms, they'll do self-insurance. So they'll insure themselves as opposed to the company having to buy insurance for the directors. But if the liability that I generated as a board member exceeds the officers and insurance policy, then they can come after my personal assets. I don't have a lot of personal assets. The bank owns most of my house. A bank owns most of my cars. I've got a little bit of personal assets. I got some furniture. I got some books on the wall behind me. I don't have a lot of assets. So if I commit a violation of my fiduciary duties and the company's DNO and insurance policy doesn't cover it, the plaintiffs in that lawsuit are going to be pretty disappointed because I don't have a lot of assets. My guess is that the board services providers, McKinsey and company, KPMG providing board services will have a lot more assets and they'll either self-insure uh, or maybe buy reinsurance as a firm or, uh, or uh, uh, have the assets available to do that. If, if I asked you, would you rather have your, uh, a service provided to you, someone building your house, uh, doing plumbing in your house, providing with legal services or consulting services, and you were worried about them going bankrupt, would you rather hire a, an individual person to do that work, or would you rather hire a global firm to do that work? I think everybody would say on that dimension, I'd rather go with the big firm. They're likely to have much bigger assets. Their reputation is likely to be more, much more robust in the market for the same reason that if I'm worried about being poisoned when I go out to eat, I think I feel safer at McDonald's than I do at a restaurant that I don't know anything about that's just a mom and a pop in a little store. Now, if I know the people uh, and they have a very good reputation, then maybe. And of course, uh, not getting poisoned is not the reason we go out to dinner. We go for delicious food. And if you want delicious food, you probably don't go to McDonald's. You probably go to the little local places. But in terms of reputation and risk, you're probably safer going uh, to McDonald's than coming to Chicago and going on a random street corner and going to a place that you've never heard of before. Um, so Vanessa asks, as the market is shrinking, companies are staying private through VCs and tokenization. Uh, would your proposal positively impact the current public companies management framework and current capital structure? Great question. So there's lots of things that are driving the uh, companies staying private. Uh, that's a whole, that's a huge topic. Um, uh, some of it probably has to do with excessive regulation. Uh, there are probably some cultural things that are happening. But what I really like about this question is it focuses on this issue, which is governance of publicly traded companies is uh, probably not optimal as it is currently designed. The arc of corporate governance in the United States went from having experts as part of your board to now boards are largely composed of political oversight, like shadow government. Uh, where we started the lecture with this sort of history as boards were basically government, we've kind of come back to that. The typical board member sees themselves as a policeman there to make sure the company is engaged in conduct that is comporting with 
uh, law, as opposed to uh, a, an expert who's trying to uh, maximize the value of the company's shares. And the growth of the private equity world is driven by a realization that this is not the right way to, to run companies. It's also driven by historically low interest rates and, and the availability of cheap debt. But the private equity model is a really a governance innovation. We take over the company, we get rid of the public shareholders, means we don't have to comply with all the corporate governance rules for publicly traded companies. We install a better management system. Managers who aren't paid a few percentage shares of the company, but who's paid an enormous share of the profits of the company. Our, ex, our, gov, our board members are not celebrities and politicians and uh, experts in academia. They're people who know the business. That governance model is proving itself to be uh, much better for a lot of companies. The problem is, and the reason why the board service provider idea uh, uh, is, I think, a, a potentially good one, is the private equity model only works where the governance improvements are so significant that they justify the risk and cost of a full takeover of the company. Taking on that much debt is really risky. If you don't do a good job, you've got bankruptcy in your future. There's a lot of governance improvements that could be made by companies who have expertise in corporate governance, but that where that's not justified by the economics of the takeover. So I do think that the private equity model has made a lot of improvements in corporate governance by going for the low hanging fruit. But above that, a little higher up in the tree, there are some potential governance improvements that could be made that are not being made because the economics don't justify it. However, if I knew that I could take over the board of a company, install better governance and make an improvement in the company's operating profits, I could do that on a fee for service basis uh, in corporate governance that doesn't, that, that, that it doesn't have to be that significant for me to make money on that. And I should just note in this <coughs> vein, I looked to try to figure out how much a company like Microsoft spends on corporate governance. I have no idea. You could read all their annual reports. You could read all their disclosures. We have no idea. You're a public shareholder of Microsoft. I don't know how much they spend on corporate governance. And I don't know anything about corporate governance. I know what their rules are, but when they met, how they voted, what, how robust their discussions are, we have no transparency. If there was a market for corporate governance where board service providers were at the annual meeting of the shareholders of Microsoft running to be the board, you would see competition. You would see proposals being made by those companies. Here's how much we're going to charge. We'll charge you $10 million a year to provide these governance services and this much equity. And then after a while to try to win that business from shareholders every year in a vote, they would show their metrics. Here's how many times we met. Here's who our directors were and how they made decisions. Here's all the expertise that they got. Here's the changes that we made. You would see a lot more information about corporate governance. As someone who studies this for a living, I'm amazed at how little I know about how companies make these kinds of decisions, not proprietary secrets, but just the basic facts. Uh, and that's because there is no market. Okay, you have time for more, uh, two questions. No more than this, Thais, please. Thais? Todd, I don't know about Thais. Okay. okay, well, let me, let me just say that- please, go um, ahead. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm very grateful for people for listening. Uh, you can, and I will give my slides to uh, FGV and they can share them with you. I didn't get a chance to go through the securities proposal in detail, but you'll see it in there. You can find me on the internet. Um, my email address is toddh at uchicago.edu. You can see it there. If you have questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you about what I talked about or about the securities law proposals or anything else. Um, I would love if there are people out there who want to come and study 
uh, with my colleagues and me to be LLMs at University of Chicago. We'd love to have you once we uh, have the back in person. Uh, and I hope that all of you uh, have an interest in coming to hear presentations from scholars uh, from Brazil, all over South America and the United States when we convene uh, next year uh, in Sao Paulo and Rio. So I wish you all the best. Abrigado. Uh, ciao. Thank you very much. Okay, I do hope you have enjoyed this great opportunity. And I would like to invite you to join us again this, third, this Thursday, please, at the same time, 3 p.m. Chicago time and 5 p.m. Uh, Sao Paulo time. Once more, thank you so much, Professor Henderson, and Professor Rodrigo, Thais, and uh, thank you all. And please join us next Thursday. Thank you very much.